Hi everyone let's start with this chapter so this is a small chapter in this chapter we will discuss about non sporing and aerobic bacteria so these are the bacteria which will grow only in the absence of oxygen so these bacteria can be classified based on their structure there can be non sporing and aerobic rods and non sporing and aerobic cocci and in non sporing and aerobic rods we have gram positive rods and gram negative rods and in gram positive rods we have actinomyces we have eubacterium we have bifidobacterium lactobacillus and propionibacterium and in gram negative rods we have bacteroids and fusobacterium we also have non sporing and aerobic cocci which are gram positive and gram negative in gram positive the main one is peptostreptococcus and in gram negative we have vialonella so we will discuss these bacteria one by one the first bacteria we are going to discuss is peptostreptococcus and peptostreptococcus it is gram positive cocci which is a non sporing and aerobic bacteria so it is a gram positive cocci it is non sporing and it is an aerobic so that we know so where are these peptostreptococcus so these are the normal inhabitants of the vagina intestines and mouth so these gram positive cocci they are arranged in short chains sometimes they are arranged in pairs like diplococci sometimes they are arranged individually and they are non sporing so they are strictly anaerobic that is even if there is 0.01 percentage of oxygen in the environment it will not grow and it is catalase negative and members of the gram positive anaerobic cocci so what are these peptostreptococcus these are normal inhabitants of the vagina intestine and mouth and they cause several clinical infections like they cause osteomyelitis which is an infection and an inflammation of the bone or the bone marrow then it can cause abscesses in brain and lungs and other different organs also and they can cause puerperal sepsis they can cause urinary tract infection they can cause genital infections they can cause wound infections and they can cause gangrenous appendicitis and these peptostreptococcus they cause suppurative lesions that is they will have pus in the lesions and mostly the abscesses in lungs abscesses in brain so all these abscesses are caused by a subspecies of peptostreptococcus called as peptostreptococcus magnus and if you talk about the puerperal sepsis it is caused by peptostreptococcus and aerobius we also have peptostreptococcus asacroliticus and peptostreptococcus tetradius so these are some other species which are commonly present in the clinical specimens so we will move on to the next bacteria which is vialonella and vialonella it is also non sporing it is also an aerobic and it is a gram negative cocci so this gram negative cocci it will be varying in sizes it can be short chains it can be in short chains it can be arranged as a diplococci like pairs it can even be arranged in groups so these are normal inhabitants of the mouth intestine and genital tract just like peptostreptococcus and the pathogenic strain the pathogenic subspecies of vialonella is vialonella parvula so we have seen vialonella parvula in different clinical specimens but its pathogenic role is still uncertain so we will move on to the next group of organisms that is non sporing and aerobic gram positive bacilli so in non sporing and aerobic gram positive bacilli 
the first bacteria we will discuss is lactobacillus so in this group we have lactobacillus we have bifidobacterium we have mobilincus then we have propionibacterium so first we will start with lactobacillus so lactobacillus very important thing about lactobacillus is it is present in adult vagina so this is present in other places also in mouth and in intestines but the most important for us is that it is present in adult vagina the lactobacillus which is present in adult vagina is actually called as doderlin's bacilli this is actually non pathogenic that in in the adult vagina lactobacillus forms the healthy microbiota that is this bacteria it protects the host from urogenital infections and it is also present in the intestine this is needed for preventing gut infections this ba bacteria belongs to the normal gut microflora so it is mostly non pathogenic but sometimes we also have pathogenic strains like we have lactobacillus catenoformi so this lactobacillus catenoformi it is a pathogenic lactobacillus it causes bronchopulmonary infections and the next bacteria is bifidobacterium and this is a pleomorphic rod and it shows branching like it shows both true branching and false branching so these bacteria they are found in large numbers in our intestines and mouth then we have mobilincus so these are some species which are motile they are curved and aerobic they are gram variable rods and we have mobilincus mulieris and mobilincus courtesy so these are the two subspecies of mobilincus and these are isolated from the vagina so these two species are isolated from the vagina in bacterial vaginosis so usually bacterial vaginosis is most commonly caused by gardnerella vaginalis most commonly but sometimes we also have such species like mobilincus mulieris and mobilincus courtesy which have been isolated from the clinical specimens of the patients with bacterial vaginosis so this bacterial vaginosis is a polymicrobial infection so this will cause some vaginal discharge which is giving rotten fish smell so this infection it is caused when the ph of the vagina is changed normally the ph of the vagina should stay acidic so if it becomes alkaline then there is a there are more chances of developing bacterial vaginosis so the bacterial vaginosis we can see some type of cells which are called as clue cells so these clue cells are nothing but epithelial cells which are which who surface it is covered by many bacilli which are adhered to these cells so those are called as clue cells and thus such cells are uh, seen in bacterial vaginosis so then let's move on to the next group of microorganisms that is an aerobic gram negative bacilli so in our aerobic gram negative bacilli we have many medically important microorganisms so the first microorganism that we are going to see is bacteroids so these bacteroids are non motile species they are strict anaerobes they are pleomorphic they appear as slender rods they also have branching forms and they are cocobacilli so these are also seen in pairs or sometimes these are seen in short chains so they grow well on a culture media such as brain heart infusion agar and definitely in an anaerobic atmosphere it should contain at least 10 percentage of carbon dioxide so these they possess capsular polysaccharides which are their virulence factors so this capsular polysaccharide it evokes an immune response or an antibody response that we can detect in patients if they have a bacteroidal infection so these bacteroidals bacteroids these organisms are normal inhabitants 
so these are norman inhabitants of intestine female genital tracts and even these organisms are found in respiratory tract so we have subspecies of bacillus like bacillus melaninogenicus and bacillus fragilis so bacillus fragilis so this is the microorganism it is the anaerobe that is most frequently coming in the clinical specimens so if we have like specimens from blood pleural and peritoneal fluids csf even from brain abscesses wounds so in all these clinical specimens we can isolate this bacillus fragilis and the next microorganism we are going to see is porphyromonas so this porphyromonas it is a saccharolytic pigmented species so this species it was uh, previously it was classified under bacteroids but since this is a saccharolytic pigmented species now it has a separate uh, genus which is porphyromonas so in porphyromonas we have two important organisms we have porphyromonas gingivalis and porphyromonas endodontalis so porphyromonas gingivalis it is the one that is responsible for periodontal diseases and porphyromonas endodontalis this is the one that is responsible for dental root canal infections and the next one is privotella so privotella even this organism it was previously classified under bacteroids but now we have a separate genus for this that is privotella this privotella has privotella melaninogenica we also have bacteroides melaninogenicus but this is different from that one we have privotella melaninogenica we have privotella buccalis we have privotella dentigola so these are some of the subspecies of privotella and privotella melaninogenica it causes lung abscess it causes liver abscess it can cause mastoiditis and intestinal lesions it can also cause lesions of the mouth and the gums so this privotella melaninogenica it is easy to recognize when we culture it because it is going to produce some pigment so this is not due to the melanin pigment it is due to a heme derivative the pigment color is coming so this will give black or brown color colonies that you can see in the picture that is given and also this privotella melaninogenica it produces a characteristic red fluorescence when exposed to ultraviolet light so we can see red fluorescence in cultures of privotella melaninogenica and even dressings from the wound of this bacillus it gives a characteristic red fluorescence when exposed to uv light and the next bacterium is fusobacterium fusobacterium these are long thin spindle shaped bacilli they have pointed ends so they also have some subspecies like we have fusobacterium nucleatum which is a normal inhabitant of the mouth and even if there is oral infection or pleuropulmonary sepsis so in oral infection and pleuropulmonary sepsis we can see fusobacterium nucleatum in those clinical specimens and there is fusobacterium necroforum so this fusobacterium necroforum it uh, produces a lot of exotoxins and this is responsible for liver abscesses and it is also responsible for uh, some abdominal infection infections in animals and even in humans then we have leptotrichia buccalis so this leptotrichia buccalis it was formerly known as vincent fusiform bacillus it was fusobacterium fusiforme so this leptotrichia it is a long straight slightly curved rod with pointed ends just like fusobacterium so this is a part of normal oral flora
and it is seen in acute necrotizing lesions in the mouth so there is a common condition that is called as vincent's angina so if you see the picture this this lesion it looks like the lesion of the cornibacterium diphtheriae but this is not caused by cornibacterium uh, diphtheriae this is caused by fusobacterium fusiforme and this vincent angina it is it has another name which is called as trench mouth trench mouth so it is a progressive painful infection it even causes ulceration there going to be swelling and the dead tissue is going to slough off from the mouth and the throat so in this uh, vincent angina there is going to be superficial ulceration and there is going to be necrosis of tonsils and pharynx and this also results sometimes results in the formation of a pseudo membrane and there's definitely going to be foul smelling breath breath that is why it is called as trench mouth and there's going to be pain during swallowing that clinical symptom is called as odynophagia there are going to be lymphoadenopathy adenopathy in the submandibular lymph nodes so this is vincent's angina moving on let's talk about the characteristics of an aerobic infection so we have discussed a lot of an aerobic bacteria and most of the an aerobic bacteria there are a lot of different names and facts to remember so let us just see the general characteristics of these an aerobic bacterial infections which are relatable to all the microorganisms so you don't have to uh, study them separately so as a whole let's see what are the different characteristics of these infections the first characteristic is these infections generally follow some precipitating factors like before these infections there is going to be some factors that is going to cause these infections like there can be trauma there can be some tissue necrosis due to some reasons like and there can be some impaired circulation again due to some reasons there can be hematoma which can start these uh, infections there can be presence of foreign bodies so there can be different precipitating factors that can be present and mostly these an aerobic infection generally follow some some of these precipitating factors and the second one is predisposing factors that is there there can be some uh, predisposing factors like there can be diabetes which is a predisposing factor there can be malnutrition there can be malignancy there can be any immunodeficiency state the patient may be in prolonged treatment due to any chronic uh, conditions the patient may be taking antibiotics for a longer time so these are all some of the predisposing factors that will dispose a particular patient to an anaerobic infection so there can be precipitating factors also there can be predisposing factors also and usually these infections are polymicrobial that is more than one anaerobe will be responsible for these infections so in many in most of the clinical cases you can see aerobic bacteria and you can see more than one aerobe anaerobe that will be involved in that infection so that is why it is called as a polymicrobial infection and more an anaerobic infections are typically polymicrobial then this disseminations that is whenever this anaerobic infection is happening starting the infection is going to be localized after that the infection can lead to bacteremia and this bacteremia will cause general dissemination this emanation means there is going to be diffuse spread of the disease process like it is origination is in from uh, it is from a place and then it is going to spread beyond that origin so that is called as dissemination so most of the anaerobic infections are going to be disseminated then about the pus so the anaerobic infections they give some clinical features that will suggest the presence of anaerobic infection so one of them is pus 
the pus that is produced in an anaerobic infection is usually putrid it is going to give a very uh, bad smell and it gives that odor which is nauseating odor there may be exceptions because the pus which is produced by bacteroids fragilis this is actually free of smell exceptions are always there but mostly the anaerobic infection will give a pus that is going to be putrid and very bad in order then we have this point which is cellulitis that is most of the anaerobic wound infections in most of the anaerobic wound infections we have a common feature that is pronounced cellulitis other features like toxemia and fever these are not uh, very well marked in anaerobic infections but when there is an anaerobic wound infection there is definitely going to be a pronounced cellulitis so these are some of the common characteristics of anaerobic infections so now let's uh, see about the laboratory diagnosis of these infections the first one we will talk about is specimens the first thing that we will talk about is specimen so we know anaerobes are present in the normal flora of the skin and the mucous membrane so if we take a clinical specimen and if this anaerobe is present in that clinical specimen that does not mean that that anaerobe is the one that caused that infection so specimens should be collected from the wound lesions from the abscesses very cautiously that we have to avoid the resident flora for the misdiagnosis so first one is we have to cautiously take specimens to avoid resident flora and the second point is transport so whenever we have to do an anaerobic culture we have to we we have to transport them in an oxygen free environment so because when uh, we transport some anaerobes can die on exposure to oxygen so we should take maximum care to minimize the contact with air during the collection and the transport and even in transport we have to make sure there should be oxygen free environment for ex for that we can use some media like we can use robertson's cook to meat medium we can use pre reduced and aerobic sterilized medium for transporting we can use towards transport medium then we can also use some gassed out wire gassed out wires means oxygen is removed and it is replaced with carbon dioxide or by nitrates so these are some of the transport mediums that are commonly used for transporting of anaerobic specimens then we can do gas liquid chromatography just to get some presumptive information from the specimen if there is any anaerobe present we can also do ultraviolet examination because some species like uh, melanogenica melanogenica it shows bright red fluorescence and we can also use microscopy but if the exposure to the oxygen environment it should be kept minimum so besides all these we can also culture these uh, microorganisms so several special culture media that uh, are present which can be used for anaerobes like we can use some blood agar with neomycin yeast extract and heme in vitamin k so we can use blood agars we can use a gas park system so this system provides a convenient method for routine anaerobic cultures so these are some of the ways that we can diagnose the anaerobic microorganisms so with this we have concluded this chapter